In this video, we're going to look at some basic trading strategies that involve the use of derivative securities. We're going to look at strategies that involve both forwards and futures and options. We're going to start by looking at futures trading strategies. And when we look at these strategies, we're looking at them from the point of view of an investment manager, as opposed to a corporation that's using these products purely for risk management. There are three common ways in which futures and forwards are used as part of a trading strategy. The first is portfolio insurance. The second is anticipatory hedging. And the third is tactical asset allocation. We're going to start with portfolio insurance. You're an investment manager who has set a goal of beating the S&P 500 index this year. But by August, you feel that the economic outlook is poor. You want to lock in your profits, but you're required to maintain your positions in the stock market. Your portfolio composition is similar to that of the S&P 500 index. It's not identical, but it's close. This diagram highlights the conundrum faced by the portfolio manager. Currently, the portfolio value in August is relatively high, and the manager is concerned that by the end of the year, the portfolio value is going to decrease. Can we use a futures contract to eliminate this risk? Well, we could use a futures contract. What we want to do is we want to agree a price to sell the S&P 500 at in December. Now, what type of futures contract would we have to enter into? Would we be long or would we be short? Well, recall that when we're trading with futures, if we're long the futures contract, it means we're agreeing to buy the underlying asset in the future. We want to sell the underlying asset in the future. So we want to be short a futures contract in the S&P 500 with an expiration date in December. The short position looks the opposite of the long position. So here we have the short position. So we take a short futures position with a maturity in December. Just before the end of December, you make an offsetting futures trade to net out your futures position. This strategy will completely eliminate any exposure to the S&P 500. Why? We'll have a look at this graph. Suppose the value of the S&P 500 falls. The value of our portfolio has gone down. But the value of our short futures position has gone up because we've still agreed to sell at our pre-agreed price. In other words, we've eliminated any risk whatsoever. But we've eliminated not just downside risk, we've also eliminated upside risk. Suppose, contrary to your opinion, the stock market goes up. Because you've locked in and agreed to sell at a fixed price in the future, you make a loss on your short futures position while making a gain on your portfolio. The net effect is that your portfolio value will remain constant. This is, a this is a means of portfolio insurance. Whatever happens now, we have locked in the value of the portfolio for the year end. The second use of futures is anticipatory hedging. Suppose you're a fund manager and you're anticipating a $500 million cash flow injection into your fund in about three months time. But you feel that the market today is undervalued and you want to lock in today's market levels so that the client will benefit despite not investing the $500 million for a further three months. Is it possible to do this using forwards and futures? The answer is yes. Suppose we take a long position in the S&P 500 futures with an expiration date in three months time. How much does that cost us today? 
Well, the value of a futures contract at initiation is zero. So it costs us nothing today. We may have to put up some margins if we're using futures, but that might just be some of the stocks that you already own. So the costs of anticipatory hedging are very low. Now what happens with this anticipatory hedging? We've taken a long position in the S&P 500 futures, which means that in three months' time, we have agreed to buy into the S&P 500 at a fixed price. If the S&P 500 is undervalued and starts to go up in value within this three-month period, we're going to make a profit, and that will lock in the gain for our future client. In three months' time, we'll want to reverse the long position so that we don't have any exposure in the futures market. The final common use of futures in a portfolio strategy is tactical asset allocation. This refers to changing asset allocations for short to medium term periods to take advantage of a perceived relative mispricing. What do I mean by that? Well, suppose you expect small firms to underperform relative to large firms over the next six months. How could we exploit this view? We could go long the S&P 100 futures. This is a basket of large firms. So this is a futures contract on a basket of large firms. And we think that large firms are going to outperform small firms over the next six months. That's why we go long the large firms. And that's why we're going to go short the futures contract on the S&P small cap 600. This is a futures contract on small firms. At the end of six months, or indeed earlier, if the mispricing corrects itself earlier, we make offsetting trades, which would be going short the S&P 100 futures and going long the S&P small cap 600 futures. If you have a view about the underlying stocks, why are you trading futures, not the stocks themselves? The answer relates to leverage. Suppose you have $1 million available to invest. You feel that small firms are going to perform really well over the next six months. You have two options now. You could invest directly in a portfolio of small firms and use margin trading. And we know that the initial margin is normally set to 50%. That means if you invest $1 million, the brokerage will also allow you to borrow $1 million. So your total exposure would be equal to $2 million. You could also go long the S&P small cap 600 futures. The big difference between using the futures and the actual underlying stocks is the margin requirements. For futures, the margin requirement is at most 10% as opposed to 50% for stocks. That means that the total exposure using futures can be much larger. In this case, we have $1 million available to invest. If we posted all of that $1 million as margin, we could have a total exposure of $10 million. This can be contrasted to the total exposure of $2 million if we directly invested in a portfolio of small firms. So futures are cool in the sense that you can use futures and forwards to lever up your positions. But the success of using futures to trade on views about a market or a stock is dependent only on the quality of your views. And the big question is, why should your view be any better than that of the market? If your view is incorrect, rather than making larger profits, you're going to make larger losses. And this is something that we see in the futures and forwards markets all the time. We see investors making spectacular gains and spectacular losses. So it's important to recognize that by using futures, we may be able to increase our leverage, but we're also increasing our risk. Another problem associated with the use of futures is that of matching the time frames. For example, earlier in this lecture, we looked at a case where the portfolio manager had reached August and wanted to lock in their profits. One way to do this was to trade a futures contract with a maturity in December. 
What would happen if there was no futures contract available maturing in December? But instead, there was only a futures contract available that matured in a year's time, so the following August. In this situation, you'd have to choose to take on, you'd have to choose to trade that futures contract instead, even though it doesn't perfectly match your desired time frame. Then you'd have to reverse that contract at the end of December. Another problem with futures is matching assets. Again, consider the example where at the start of class in which we had a portfolio that was similar to the S&P 500 but not identical. And we hedged this portfolio by taking a short position in the S&P 500 futures contract. These two assets, the futures contract on the S&P 500 and our portfolio, do not match up perfectly. There is what we would call basis risk. And basis risk is just the futures price of the contract used to hedge minus the spot price of the hedged asset. If the assets are identical, there is no basis risk. But if the assets are not identical, then you do need to think about basis risk. Now let's move on to option trading strategies. Again, we're going to focus on uses of derivatives from the point of view of an investment manager as opposed to a corporation looking to use derivatives for risk management. We're going to consider three common uses of options. Income enhancement, portfolio insurance and volatility plays. We've already seen income enhancement in the video lecture on options. If you own the stock, you could write a covered call option on that stock to convert the potential future income gains into current income. Suppose you own Intel stock and you write a call against Intel with a strike price of $25. If someone buys that call option from you, you receive the call premium or the price, thereby converting the future upside potential into a current gain, which is the premium. You can increase your gains today by writing a call with a lower strike price, such as $20 as opposed to $25. This is a very good strategy if you are bearish about Intel's prospects, since it provides some downside protection for you. To understand how we get limited downside protection, think about the premium we receive. We may get in a premium of $3. So if the stock falls in value, we can offset our losses with the premium that we got from selling the call option. That's why there is some limited downside protection. We can see the idea, we can see the concept of income enhancement more clearly on a diagram. Here we have two positions. We have our underlying position in Intel and we have our short call position. We've written a call option with a strike price of 25. How does this lead to income enhancement? Well, what happens when we sell the call option? We receive a premium. Let's call that C0, the premium we receive. And now let's combine the underlying position in Intel with the short call. If the value of Intel is less than $25, the value of the call is zero. So all we have is our long position in Intel. Now, when the strike when the, when the value of Intel hits the strike price at 25, we know that this option is going to be exercised by whoever bought it from us. What happens now to our net position? We have our underlying position in Intel. So if Intel goes up $1, we make $1. But our short position on the call means that if Intel goes up by $1, we lose $1 on the call. That means we gain one from our underlying position in Intel and we lose one from our short call. The net result is a flat line. What we've done 
we've converted our potential future income gains into current income gains in the form of receiving the premium on the option that we've written, C0. Now let's return to our portfolio insurance example from earlier. You're an investment manager who has set the goal of beating the S&P 500 index this year. And by August, recall that you feel the economic outlook is poor. You want to lock in your profits while retaining upside exposure. And you are required to maintain your positions in the stock market. Your portfolio composition is similar to that of the S&P 500 index. You want to lock in your profits, but you want to maintain upside exposure. In other words, you want to make sure that your portfolio cannot fall in value. How would you do this? Here is our underlying position in the S&P 500. How do we ensure our portfolio does not fall in value but retains upside exposure? We could take a long position in a put option. So suppose we took a long position with a strike price equal to K. Here is the payoff from our put. The maturity on this put option would be December because we want to ensure the minimum value of our portfolio in December. Now let's combine our positions. We have our long position in the stock market and we have our long position in the December put. If the value of the S&P falls after August, we know that we can always put the value to the person. We bought a put option with a strike price equal to K, which is the value of the S&P 500 index in August. So whatever happens, if the value of the S&P 500 index falls over the next six months, we will exercise our put option to ensure we receive a minimum equal to the value of the S&P 500 in August. If the S&P 500 actually goes up over the next six months, the put option will expire worthless and we will just be left with our underlying position in the S&P 500. We've now locked in a minimum value for our portfolio while maintaining upside exposure to the stock market. The final trading strategy we're going to consider is a volatility play. You're uncertain about unemployment and economic growth numbers. The numbers are going to be published in one month and you anticipate large changes, but you cannot predict the direction of the changes. How could you exploit this view? You think there's going to be large changes. That's the key. The problem is you can't predict which way the changes are going to be. Is the economy going to look better or look worse? When you're in this situation, you can form a strategy called a straddle. You would go long and at the money put option on the S&P 500. And you would also go long and at the money call option on the S&P 500. It's important to remember, however, that there are costs associated with this strategy. It's often expensive to purchase at the money options. The cheapest options to purchase are out of the money options. Then it's at the money options, while the most expensive are in the money options. Suppose we do take a straddle position on the S&P 500 today. That would mean we go long one put option and long one call option for the next month. Here's the payoff from our long put option. And here's the payoff from our long call option. You can see that we're going to profit whichever way the S&P 500 moves. The only time we won't profit is if the S&P 500 doesn't move at all. So if the news regarding unemployment and economic growth is consistent with the market's expectations and there are, low, and there are no large changes, we're going to lose money. But if there are big changes in unemployment or growth, we're going to gain money. This is a volatility play. That's what I want to cover in this lecture. In class, we're going to consider more trading strategies that use options and futures. See you in class.